Welcome back to another episode of Gamma 20. We're studying the book of Genesis, why the beginning matters. Uh, study 15, friend of God, Genesis chapter 18. Father Lord, we ask that you open up our eyes, that we may see the truth of the wonderful truth, that through this covenant which you have given us, you have become, we have become your friends. Uh, open up our eyes to explore and experience what this means in our lives. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, we have been talking about covenant. Uh, we've got the covenant initiation in Genesis chapter 15, where God made the covenant, given land and descendants, God take the oath. There were no conditions then. Abraham believed God. It was uh, reckoned to him as righteousness. There was a voice. There was a vision. And then the confirmation was in Genesis 17. God confirmed the covenant. Uh, he was to be their God forever. Abraham made the oath sign this time. He had the circumcision done. There was God spoke to him in his voice, and Abraham promises to walk before God in righteousness. Now, in chapters 18, is after the initiation, confirmation, now is the actual relationship, how they actually walk together, and they do this in person. And it's very interesting to look at this dynamic. All right? Uh, verse 1, the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat on the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. Who were the three men? Well, if you look here, verse 8, uh, 1833, the Lord went his way when he finished speaking. And you look back here in chapter 1, the Lord appeared to him. Remember, Yahweh, right? So we see Yahweh. And then cha chapter 19, verse 1, the two angels who left them came to Sodom, and, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. So which means the three of them were basically two angels and God himself. In fact, uh, Abraham said this, when he saw them, he ran to the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the, on earth and said, O oh Lord, if I found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself and after you may pass on since you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. And Abraham quickly went to the tent to Sarah and said, quick, take uh, three seah of flour, knead it, make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the young man who prepared it quickly. And he took curds and milk and calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. So this is important. This is part of Middle Eastern hospitality. In those days, there were no hotels. And all the sojourners going through the land would expect people to greet them, expect people to look after them because there were no hotels. So hospitality was very, very important. If you were not hospitable, then you were not a good person. You were not an upright, upstanding uh, citizen. You were a bad person, as it were. So if you look at uh, even the Greeks, the, the Greek god Zeus is a god of hospitality. Um, so we have got four-stage procedure involved in Middle Eastern um, entertainment of uh, guests. One is the invitation. They will come and wait at the city gate for someone to invite you in. Then there will be a secu security screening, not with metal detectors, but with, with basically interviews, see how you are, see whether you're going to be a threat to the family. Then they will bring them to the house where they'll wash your feet. Uh, they'll be feasting, they'll be resting, and then you stay for two days, no more, don't stay two weeks, and then they depart. Right? And uh, here you actually have covenant initiation, confirmation, and then now the relationship how to how they walk together. And is this, Sim Abraham was simply doing his duty. And his reward was actually contact with God. He's supposed to walk blameless. And so if you compare him with the rest of the Middle Eastern community, what he was simply doing was acting within the realm and the ambit of what a normal Middle Eastern person would do in terms of hospitality. And his reward was contact with God, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, focus, uh, tells us hospitality is very important because it is an expression of love for God. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to the strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, those as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. So therefore, there must be some sort of solidarity which will include strangers because all strangers are made in the image of God. So walking with God is not just prayer and meditation and worship meeting. 
Uh, it is actually a very robust spirituality where you serve each other, where you actually serve prayer. This is equally reverent as this. All right. Now, here you introduce a dimension where uh, Jesus is called, uh, where God is actually the, the, the Abraham is a friend of God. You, James actually cast this. When you see that faith was active along his works and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called friend of God. Now, friend of God takes this to a new dimension. We're not just servants. They are not slaves of God. We are also friend of God. And friends have candor. They laugh and joke. They forgive each other easily. An example is, is Sarah. And they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, Well, she's in the tent. The Lord, this is God, says, I will surely return to you this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent behind him, and Sarah and Abraham were old advanced in age, nearly 100, uh, the way the way the women had ceased to be, which means with Sarah, which means no more menstruation. She probably way, way, way after uh, men, uh, menopause. So Sarah laughed to herself, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? This can be, uh, and she's laughing because you're talking about two old goats, basically nearly 100 years old. Can they actually have sex? Can they actually have uh, children? Uh, the actual translation is, after I'm worn out, my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? This actually means sexual pleasure. It's been misinterpreted by the NIV and the NLT that says, uh, after I'm worn out, my master old, now will I have this pleasure, which is pleasure having a child. Um, so actually, this is, a, this is some word of incredulity by Sarah, who says, you know, at this age, you're not, you know, don't talk about having children, but you know, I'm not going to have pleasure during sex. All right. Now, the next one is, um, there, there is progressive revelation, as you can see. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham was told that he would have this many descendants and blessing. And he thought it was basically his family. Uh, and, and it would be true. And he says he brought Lot along, and quite obviously, through the third of events, what happened to Lot, he settled far away. It was not going to be Lot. And Genesis 15, he'd been waiting for quite a long time, and, and he tells God, you know, uh, I don't have any children, so can I have my servant Eliezer? But God says, no, it's not going to be your servant, it's going to be your offspring. I said, oh, I'm thinking offspring. Yeah, well, well, okay, let's go on to chapter 16. Well, if it's my offspring, what about my mate? instead of my wife, because my wife is really old. I got a young maid, and God revealed to him, no, it's not your maid either. And it takes up to chapter 18, 20 years later on, and tells him, oh, now it's going to be your wife, and it gives him a actual date of the birth and what to call his son, exactly all given. And that tells us how God interacts with us in covenantal relationship. The revelation is progressive, bit by bit. We are not going to be told by God, every detail of our lives. It is revealed bit by bit in life because this is a kind of situation that allows you to continually trust in Him, not in how His promises are going to be revealed. So God didn't reject or punish Sarah, but was firm and reassuring. You know, uh, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, indeed, I shall bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At that appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it. Well, I didn't laugh. She was telling a lie. But God turned around and said, No, you did laugh. Now, it's not a very good idea to, laugh, to basically lie to God. So here, Sarah deals, God deals with Sarah. She has a personal encounter with God. It's no longer secondhand through Abraham. And God invites her to wonder at His grace. However old she is, she's going to have a child. And He can do more than she can imagine. This is what you do with friends. And then God contemplates sharing with Abraham. You share things. This is the first time you actually see him. God wanting to do something and having a discussion with Abraham. Abraham. You don't have a situation in many religions where God actually reveals what he wants to do and is contemplating and he lets you in on the conversation because he's God and you're a man. 
And this is amazing. And the, and, the, and the men set up from there and they looked down towards Sodom. Abraham went with them on their way to set them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of earth will be blessed through him because of the covenant. He is going to be a very consequential human being. Because from him will come the example that will spawn a great and mighty nation and many nations. So he is consequential. So shall I let him in on how I'm thinking? So God is contemplating sharing with Abraham. Now, the reason why he contemplates and he wants to share. For I have chosen him. So he is not just an ordinary man. He is someone whom God has chosen of all people in the world, God has chosen him, that he may command, which means not only it will affect Abraham, that he wants to share with him so that he has the experience of God, so that he may command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord. So therefore, his, when his, his faith will be translated into action, and it will translate it to the fidelity of his household, to keep the way of the Lord, doing righteousness and justice that God may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. All right? And, and what happens that uh, the Lord God in chapter 17 says, walk before me and be blameless. How, how, blameless and walking also has to do with righteousness and justice. How, how are you going to be righteous and just if you don't understand God's character as being righteous and just? All right? So therefore, God brings him into the conversation. So there's the election that they live righteously because they've been elected and saved, and then only they will come into covenantal promises. Leviticus says, For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Israel to be your God. You shall therefore be holy because I am holy. So the living of righteousness and understanding of what righteousness is, is not in order to gain election, but it's because you've been elected by God and chosen by grace. Right? Uh, even in chapter 1 of uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, even as He chose us, in Him before the foundation world, that we may be holy and blameless before God. The focus is to live righteously because we have been chosen to inherit God's covenantal promises. Tim Keller writes, God didn't choose Abraham because he, did what, he does what is right and just. He does what is right and just because He is chosen. And here you actually have a situation where God will actually enable Abraham to live a righteous life which is reflective of God's grace to him in order to gain the covenantal promises. Now, here God shares, all right, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether uh, according to the outcry that has come to me and if not, I will know. Now, it's very interesting, isn't it? It's like God cast the whole thing is like rumor has it someone came and told me oh those guys in Sodom and Gomorrah are really bad oh the, the sin there is atrocious then I will come down like God's gonna climb down from from heaven and and have a look see and see whether these rumors are correct if not that means there's an ambiguity if not I will know now this is basically God isn't sitting up in heaven and oblivious to whatever's happening. God doesn't have to come right down and climb down the ladder and have a bit of a look before he decides. This is anthropomorphism. What the biblical author Moses is doing is casting God in human terms to get across the idea that, that God is inviting Abraham into a divine deliberation, deliberation so that God can reveal to Abraham what his justice and mercy is about. All right? And this is what friends do. Jesus describes friendship. What is friend? There are three factors of friendship. When you actually have a friend, there are three factors here. Number one, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has none, no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. So the first feature of friendship is love. And Jesus proved it by dying on the cross from us. Nobody's got greater love than someone to die or lay down his life for us. If he doesn't want to lay down his life for you, then therefore he doesn't love you. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. Now here, don't misunderstand. All right, You do not do what he commands in order to be his friends. All right, So obedience is evidence of friendship. You say, you are my friends if you do what I command you. 
So which means if you really are my friend, then you will be obedient. If you're not my friend, you won't be obedient. So obedience is not a condition of friendship. Obedience is evidence of friendship. Right? We are friends of God. If we obey as evidence of our friendship, not as a condition in order to get friendship. Please, that is extremely important. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. Why? For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now, the third feature of friendship is disclosure and candor. Whatever God has revealed to his son about salvation and about the truth, Jesus has revealed to them. So therefore, he lets them into his circle and thinking. There's love, obedience, evidence of friendship, and disclosure and candor. That is what it means that God calls us his friend. This is not what it means. That Jesus, my friend, very buddy-buddy, informal, irreverent, take for granted. Uh, you love only when there are blessings. There's no blessing. I get very angry with God. Obedience only if there's benefit or ignore disclosure of the Word of God. Just focus on what you read the parts of the Bible or what God can do for you. All the rest for obedience, I don't want to know. That is a wrong picture of what a friend of God is. And here you actually have Sodom and Gomorrah. There is a sinful city and it deserves to be judged by God and destroyed. And we are going to see in this conversation the tension between grace God's grace and loving mercy, and God's justice and truth. How does this play out in the divine mind? All right, And this is the Abrahamic prayer. He, Abraham is like the priest. He stands before God on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, even though he doesn't know them, but he represents them, as it were, as a priest, and negotiates with God or enters into discussion. So the man turned from there and went to, towards Sodom. Abraham stood still before the Lord, and Abraham drew near, and will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So therefore, uh, it is actually God who initiates the, prayer, the, 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 the discussion. So and Abraham drew near to God, so we draw near through prayer. It is a response to God sharing his intentions. So God invites Abraham in partnership. So here we have an endeavor that God wants to judge this sinful nation, and he invites Abraham to be part of that deliberating council. Here you can see a partnership between God and man, which is not very much different from when we partner with God in evangelistic activity and pray on our knees, working with God for the fate of nations around us. It is specific and persistent. Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city, will you, will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death for the wicked with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it that from you shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just. And the Lord said, if I find this out of 50 righteous people in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. So he's persistent. Uh, and bold and specific. He, he, he asked God, you know, would you save the city if there are 45 people who are righteous? God said, yes. Would you save the city if there are 35? It cuts it right down until 10. Right? So which means uh, this, this is, uh, 10 is the, the power of prayer. So right up from 50 right down to 10, he has actually negotiated with God in such a way that God's mercy is actually amplified. Instead of just knocking off the whole city, it is because of the prayer of Abraham that this is tempered. If there are 10, right? Not 50, not 45, not 35. If there are 10, God will actually do something. They will spare the particular city. All right? So Abraham is the architect of the righteousness of God. Desire, the righteousness that God desires in the man who is called out by his purposes. Abraham is selfless, impartial, and he takes a stand for the concerns that transcend his own personal interests and obedience to God's call. So Abraham not praying for himself. He's actually starting to pray for other people. This is how you walk before God and to be blameless, right? So the prayer is also passionately humble. 
Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, but I, uh, I who, uh, who am I but dust and ashes? So he understands his position. He's not like some people coming up and standing, Oh, this believer's authority, I demand before God uh, and all these miracles. No, he comes before God and he remembers, I am but dust and ashes. Right? Now, prayer, very important, must have a theological basis. Far be it from you to do such a thing. I mean, you know, kill the, the wicked with the righteous. Put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just. So, it seemed to Abraham that if you were to kill the whole city, and, there, and even though there are about 45 people or 430 people left inside who are righteous, then the evil and the righteous suffer the same fate. Now, if that's the case, how can it be just? You are God. You are God. So basically what he's doing is that he's basing his prayer on who God is. Right? He's trying to say, you know, you know, can we spare the city based on the righteousness of a few people which will cover the evil of the wicked? The, the wickedness, the, the evil of the, the wicked deeds of the evil people. So it's basically corporate responsibility in the reverse. The prayer is for the unbelieving city. Suppose there were five of the 50 righteous are lacking, would you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? So this is an unbelieving city, and he's actually praying for people who are not his. So which is uh, basically, a, a, you can show the love of Abraham uh, being transformed with his covenant with God. Now compare this with Jonah. Abraham is praying for a wicked city, right? Um, totally terrible people, and he's asking God to save them. Look at Jonah. Jonah was tasked with God to preach to the people in Assyria, similarly like Sodom and Gomorrah, unbelieving city, evil. He actually runs away. And when he actually forced by the whale to come back and preach to the city, he preaches to the city. And they actually, it was a fantastic evangelistic program because they actually repented. When God saw what they did, which they repented, how they turned from the evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So therefore, very successful ministry. And you know what happened, Jonah? It greatly displeased Jonah and he was angry. Complete opposite of Abraham. Abraham had the kind of soft and tender heart that wanted to see mercy dispensed to the poor people, to the wicked people of Sodom. Jonah, on the other hand, was angry because God showed mercy when they repented. All right? Why stop at 10? Uh, oh Lord, let not, uh, oh, oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak again, but this one, suppose the ten are found, he answered, for the sake of ten I will not destroy. And the Lord went on his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So it is not God, Abraham, who stopped negotiating with God. Huh? It is actually God who stopped. Now, why did he stop? Well, maybe God had finished speaking, so Abraham took the, 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 the hint. Or God demonstrated already that he will care for the righteous. So Abraham didn't persist beyond that. And some people say 10 is the minimum number of adults for a synagogue believing community, which is why the conversation ended there. God, and Abraham didn't persist. God just stopped it. Right? Um, the outcome. If you fast forward to Genesis 19, it was that when God destroyed the city, uh, uh, the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which God, Lot had lived. So the whole city was destroyed, Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed, and there were only three righteous people because it's Ab uh, Lot and his two daughters, and they were saved. The wife was left behind, the son-in-laws were all left behind, and, and in fact, it, it was just three. All right, so but then through this, he understood. And here you actually look at the Abrahamic prayer, which is a paradigm for what we are now as God's friends, are to work with God to make the nations His. All right? It's based on what God has revealed. It's based on who God is. It is persistent. It is bold. It is humble. And we pray for the unbelieving city. This is what Abraham did, and this is what we as the covenantal people should be doing. And, and, and Abraham understands because of this, chapter 19, you see why does chapter uh, 19, or uh, which is Sodom and Gomorrah and chapter 18, come before chapter 22? In chapter 22, Abraham is asked by God to take your son to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him. A horrendous proposition, isn't it? But 
he was able to do this. You know why? Because he understood the interplay between justice and mercy because he has seen it with his own eyes when he negotiated with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew that this is a God who is totally just. This is a God who is totally merciful as well. And he saw the two come together in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where righteousness and justice was upheld and mercy was dispensed. And he, as he took his son up Mount Moriah with a knife in his hand to sacrifice it, he would know that this is the kind of God who will always be just and always be merciful. And he was anticipating what God would be doing. If you actually had no Sodom and Gomorrah, you would not have Genesis chapter 22. So when bad things happen, we often doubt God's justice. Is God fair? Or even if we see God's justice, we say, does God actually love us? And we get angry with God. And the problem is that anger is actually illogical. Because if you are angry with God, because you believe God is powerful enough to have prevented that catastrophe to your friend or your family, but if you believe God is powerful enough to have prevented it, isn't He powerful enough to have a good enough reason to have even allowed the event to happen? That is the problem when we're dealing with God. If you're angry at Him because He's powerful enough to prevent the issue, isn't He powerful enough to have a good reason to not have allowed the event? And here, we are asked to pray. Everyone who asks, receives and all that. And then when God doesn't answer our prayer, we quit quiet. It destroys our faith. We, we never share about what God does anymore because God doesn't answer. We give excuses to God, or oh, He's probably busy. We're silent and less bold, less trusting. We shrug our shoulders and begin to doubt, is God, He is God, what can I do? All right, prayer lists often have no thanksgiving bits for unanswered prayer because it's something that we want to sweep under the cover. We are less trusting. You know, our, our, our day and age is exemplified with this book by uh, Bob Shogren and Gerald Robinson, Cat and Dog Theology. You see, if you're a dog, you all love your master, you'll be licking him no matter what he does. If it's a cat, you have to be pandering to the needs of the cat. And, and, and that's the whole idea of being like a cat to God. God is there for all my needs. So you have selective verses like the prayer of Jabez. Jabez called the Lord that you would bless me, enlarge my border, your hands might be with me, you keep me from harm. And this is the kind of uh, prayer that we like to pray. We don't like to pray the other one, uh, which is Philippians, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and share his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Right? But the reality is, God is sovereign. Uh, even in Revelations, if anyone's to be taken captive, in captivity, he goes. If anyone to be slain with the sword, with the sword, he must be slain. Here's a call for endurance and faith. So we must endure and trust in God. As Abraham said, you are, shall not the God of all you know, world justice be done. Right? Job had a problem. A lot of injustices were done to him and God didn't really answer him. And Job in the end said, though he slay me, I will still hope in him. I will argue my way to his face, but he will still trust God. You know, years ago, in 1930s, because of the Japanese war, a lot of Koreans were displaced to Vladivostok in Russia. Stalin repositioned them in these areas, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and all that. And they thought they were, you know, lost from their homeland. And these are predominantly Muslim nations. And because the Koreans were Christians who were there for many, many, many years later on, you can find that they grew up and it became part of the community. And in 1990, it was the first open-air uh, Christian meeting in the history of such Central Asia as a young Korean-American preached to a crowd in the streets of Alma Ata, the capital of Kazakhstan. See, God has a plan. Nobody can upend His plans. We just need to trust. Even bad things happen. If you look at uh, this young lady who is basically Joni Erickson, who, who actually fractured her neck and, and basically be paralyzed for the next 50 years of her life, she has been an encouragement and blessing to so many people. And she writes these words, uh, If I were still on my feet, it's hard to say how things would have gone. I probably would have drifted through life, marriage, yeah, maybe even divorce, dissatisfied, disillusioned. When I was high school, I reacted to life selfishly and never built on any long-lasting values and almost always at the expense of others. And then, but now, are you happy? A teenage girl asked, I really am. I wouldn't change my life, which means the chair, for anything. 
I'm really thankful He did something to get my attention and change me. It is the enlargement of our souls, putting our lives at the disposal of a God who is just and merciful. Now, Abraham was the high priest pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. Today, the only high priest that we have is Jesus Christ, our high priest. Better than Abraham. Why? Because he's truly righteous. Hebrews 4 says, Since then we have a high, great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. All right? Because he's passed through heaven, he's right at the right hand of God. We do not have high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Better than Abraham, more righteous than Abraham, we have a high priest who is Jesus Christ. And that's the person whom we must entrust as we pray and move. So we as a people of God work in partnership with God. Jesus Christ hears our prayer. We are the people who, are, who should be deeply intimate with God and deeply sympathetic with our world as we raise our hands and pray to the name of Jesus to minister to this world in His namesake. Amen.